Hi, I'm Robert Jeffers, Senior Pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. Very recently, we were privileged to host a very special interview that I'd like to share with you. David Green is the founder of Hobby Lobby. More importantly, he's a Christian businessman whom I deeply respect. He was joined by his colleague and co-author Bill High. Together, David and Bill have written a brand new book entitled Leadership Not by the Book. Just before the interview begins, I want you to know that I deeply respect David Green, not for his huge success with a chain of 900 stores that employ more than 50,000 people. I respect David Green because he's decided to guide his successful enterprise by biblical standards. In his own words, David is not the owner of Hobby Lobby. He's a steward of God's gift. His moral compass is calibrated not by popular opinion, but by the Bible. And as you'll hear in a moment, David Green has taken tremendous personal risks to make sure that Hobby Lobby honors God rather than man. Now, David rarely grants personal interviews. He doesn't need the publicity, but he agreed to speak with us. And I'm confident that you'll be inspired by his God-fearing lessons on leadership. To guide the conversation is Ben LaVorn, our executive pastor here at First Baptist Church in Dallas. Ben, take it away. On this very special edition of Pathway to Victory, we are joined today by David Green and Bill High. David Green is the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby, and Bill is the founder and CEO of Vine Legacy and has served along David for many years. And we want to thank you on behalf of our pastor and Bible teacher, Dr. Robert Jeffress, for being here with us today. Uh, Welcome, David and Bill to Pathway to Victory. Thank you. We're honored to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, we are here today to talk primarily about your new book, Leadership Not by the Book, 12 Unconventional Principles to Drive Incredible Results. Now, this is a life-changing book, I think, for many Christian businessmen as they read about your principles. But before we get in to some of those principles, David, I want to talk a little bit about your story. Uh, God has blessed you in so many ways, bringing you from humble beginnings to becoming the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby, uh, over 900 stores, almost 50,000 employees. Would you share with us a little bit about your story and what God's done in your life? Well, the main thing that I think is my heritage. I came from a pastor's home with uh, five brothers and sisters, and uh, My mother and dad, I think, wanted all of us to be pastors or missionaries, but uh, somehow or another, I got off in left field and became a merchant. So that's my background, and I love my heritage from my parents that serve the Lord, and and obviously, I learned a lot from them. Tell us about how you started Hobby Lobby. Yeah, uh, I worked for a company called TGNY, and back in those days, back in the 80s and so forth, they were probably the retail... uh, company. It wasn't Walmart. It was TGNY, and we were opening stores all over the country, and I wanted to join the company because I wanted to be a store manager because where I came from, that would be the big deal is to become a store manager. And so there was a time that we just decided, hey, we want to do something on our own. So we wanted to be in retail because that's our love, but you don't just open up a Hobby Lobby store with no money, but you can borrow $600 and start a business. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We borrowed $600, bought a wood chopper, and started making little miniature frames in in our garage. My two boys were seven and nine, and they would work to glue these frames together, and we paid them seven cents a piece. We had no money, obviously, other than the $600, so my wife worked for five years for zero. So that's kind of how we got started, is in our garage making these little miniature frames. That's incredible. Did you ever envision what Hobby Lobby could and would become? No, I, I, I dreamed because I came from a chain store. I think I dreamed of having a few stores as a big dream when you're starting with nothing, but obviously God has blessed us beyond anything we could have even imagined. Yeah, I'd say that's true. Now you have led Hobby Lobby in fairly unconventional ways. And that's what you talk about in your book. You outline the principles that define your leadership. And Bill, I know you've been instrumental in helping to put some of those principles into practice. But the first principle you talk about is really foundational uh, to your whole approach, and that is to give the true owner the vote. And you talk about the difference between being an owner and a steward. Can you share with us what that means to you? 
I think where we talk about uh, giving God the owner is at some point, maybe you are able to do a lot of things because God has blessed you and you can make things happen. And so that's when it's very, very scary, really, that you know you can make things happen and you shouldn't, that you really need to seek the Lord and in prayer try to find a way that you know that this is God's will. So sometimes it's sort of like throwing a fleece out. For instance, if we're going to buy some big building or some project, we may have a number out there that's so impossible that it's got to be God. Because yeah. we want to make sure that when we do something of any size at all, that we know that he gets a vote because we just don't want to do something. And by the way, we've done that more than we would like, that <laughs> we really want to know that this is what he would have for us. You know, you talk about how these principles apply in business, in the home. Uh, so how can each one of us uh, implement these practices of what it means to be not an owner, but a steward? Yeah, I think there is a world difference between saying you're a steward and you are a steward because I think us Christian guys and businessmen will all say God owns it. But we, if we stop and think what the difference is between ownership, ownership and stewardship is a world of difference. And so we had to, we had to learn what that was. And, uh, I learned when we had someone trying to help us with our, what we had, which was something that was very valuable. And I was concerned of how it could affect my family mm -hmm. negatively and how do I hand this down. And basically they told me ways to save on taxes and also just to hand this down to my children. Mm -hmm. And they would hand it down to their children. Mm -hmm. And it was probably the worst times in my life because mm -hmm. I knew that this could actually doesn't have to ruin my family. But we know that it could if you mm -hmm. do any study at mm -hmm. all what finances can do. And so we decided that, uh, in, in, in fact, in my prayer time, I just know the Lord spoke to me and says, what would you do with Hobby Lobby if the Jones family, well, that was the paradigm change. Mm -hmm. I said, children, I've got nothing to give you. This belongs to God. So that was where I went from saying that God owns it to doing whatever it took um, uh, with legally to make mm -hmm. sure that it was his. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important uh, that you came to this realization through seeking the Lord that's through prayer. And it was really God who laid it on your heart. And it just coincided with the Bible, by the way. Yeah. You know, it's the Bible says he owns everything. So that was the same thing the Holy Spirit was telling me. You don't have anything to give away, but what we can give to our family is opportunities. And so we give our family opportunities. Anyone can come on board, but they would get they would get paid for what they earn, but not anything that they don't earn. I think that's yeah. also biblical as well. That's great. And Bill, you've seen David and his family put this into practice. So share with us from your perspective, how you've seen this principle in action. Yeah, the ownership versus stewardship question is a big one. Any business owner, anybody that's led something to realize that you're not the owner of the stock. And so in their family, they actually gave away the stock. They locked it up. So nobody has rights to the stock. That's a big, radical idea. But to your question, part of this applies whether you own a Hobby Lobby or whether you're the guy that's just trying to make payroll. You're just trying to make the mm -hmm. budget meet mm -hmm. or you just got a car give up the ownership to God and say, God, it's yours. I'm going to be the best steward possible of whatever you put in my hand. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, the next principle that really builds on that foundation is listen to and obey the Holy Spirit above all. So if God is the owner, you have to give him the vote. You have to listen to his voice. And he speaks to us sometimes through prayer, oftentimes through scripture. So how has scripture and reading the Bible uh, influenced the decisions that you're making as a business leader? I think at first you, you've said it, and that is the scripture. What are we doing and does it really light up mm -hmm. with God's word? Um, and, and that's what we want to do. We want to know God's word. We want to love God's word. And that's why, of course, we've gotten involved with the museum and a lot of mm -hmm. other things that mm -hmm. we love God's word. And so that's the, the, the important thing for us is to... Uh, but prayer is the other thing that mm -hmm. I think that we really want to make sure that we're praying. Now, we can also say God owns a business and we pray, but does God really own it and do we really pray? And we mm -hmm. want to make sure, or I do, that I do talk to him daily. So I like the scripture that says pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do. I try to go to work and you have 
you can have challenges by the hour sometimes, but I just want to walk with him. And one of the ways that I do that is I just know that he's with me right mm-hmm. now. He's with us here right mm-hmm. now. He never leaves us nor forsakes That's us. Right. So knowing that and knowing also that we have not because we ask not, but we want to make sure we're asking for the right reasons. And that is to grow our business so we can do more in the ministry projects that we're involved in. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I I love about your book is these are not just uh, philosophies or theories. These are actions that you put into practice. So how do you incorporate your time with the Lord into your daily and weekly routines as you go about life? I think the best way I could say that is that Barbara and I are in the Word every morning before we get out and, and start the day. And we're with prayer, and we also try to do that daily. My wife is a little bit more disciplined than I in her prayer, so we asked, she asked God to wake her up in the middle of the night. I have never asked God to wake me up in the middle of the night. So she's up in the middle of the night, and she's in her prayer room, and uh, and so it's really neat to where that we come together and we try to find out what God would have for us in our lives. Yeah, that's great. And Bill, you've seen them put this into practice, and I know you practice this as well. So tell us, again, from your perspective, how you see Scripture as uh, the guiding uh, light uh, in in the way they lead Hobby Lobby. Well, David talked about it, this idea that he really does see Jesus right beside him every single day. And lots of times, you know, on a day-by-day basis, we say that we are going to pray. We're going to pray about our work, pray about our business, whatever it is that we're doing. But do we really? And so what I've seen inside of David and the family is that they pray about the little things, the things that we tend to take for granted because we've got skill or we've got experience or like, I know how to do that. Mm. But David's praying about things like scissors. You know, how many scissors should I carry? How about how much ribbon should I carry? One of the things too, Ben, that as we put the book together, I had the opportunity to interview some of the different C-level leaders. And one of the big markers of that, it was actually one of their chaplains, one of the people that are out and about. And we always ask the same question. What is the secret sauce? What is it that makes this thing work? And the the big hallmark of what she said is that David tries to hear from God every day and then to obey it. And what a revolutionary mm-hmm. thing that would be if we truly did that on a day-by-day basis. That's hear right. from God and obey no matter what. That's right. You know, sometimes God's instructions to us and the truths of Scripture make no sense to the world. And I know there's been times, David, that God has led you to make some decisions that maybe went against conventional business thinking. Can you share with us a time when you've heard from the Lord and it's uh, urged you to make one of those decisions? Yeah, and I also like to say in ending, every time that I've done something that makes no sense, it looks like it's going to cost money, it's cost us money. Yeah. So to tell everybody, you do what God asks you to do, and it's going to be better. I remember when he asked us to close on Sunday. Unfortunately, we started opening on Sunday, and we shouldn't have. But I know that the Holy Spirit talked to my wife, myself, that we needed to close on Sunday. And so everybody says, God's going to bless you, and God's going to bless you. And so I'm looking, and I'm saying, well, something's wrong here. These sales are yeah. down. The profits are down. But I think he wants us to do things because it's the right thing to do and not because he's going to bless us. Now, in the bigger picture, he's blessed us beyond Mm -hmm. anything that we could ever, ever expect. Mm -hmm. So just recently, we have been selling Halloween because I came up as a preacher's son and I was the first one out there and the last one off the streets because it was a big opportunity to get all this candy. But we knew that he was telling us that we shouldn't be selling Halloween And so we gave Halloween up, which was very, very expensive. So there's a lot of things we've done that's the right thing to do. But in our case, in every case, it's cost us in the in in the immediate. But in the longer run, it's been good that we have tried to follow the Lord Mm -hmm. when he's uh, instructed us in a different area. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important for our viewers and our listeners to hear, you know, sometimes Uh, we misunderstand that as long as we're making the right decision, then we'll be blessed in the here and now. And that's not always the case, as you've said. In each case, it's actually cost you. Uh, But ultimately, God has blessed that decision. Probably every case that I can think of that it has cost me. But 
but we know that God wants us to do things not because he has a big bag of cookies for us when we do the right thing. He wants us to do it. He died for us and he paid his life. And so we should be able to do whatever it takes to do what we know he would have us to do. You know, sometimes, uh, no matter how much we seek the Lord in prayer and seek clear answers in Scripture, we're faced with difficult decisions. And we don't always hear that clear, compelling voice from the Lord. Uh, is there a time when uh, you've been faced with a difficult decision and you didn't necessarily have clear direction uh, from the Lord? And how did you navigate that process? You know, I think in most cases, and that happens often, it's not real clear. I remember when a neighbor came to us and he had his two families and their children working, I mean, in his home. And he was in a big trouble. The bank was fixing to foreclose on him. He owed $1.5 million on his house. And he came to me for help. And I, I was in that perfect position that you were saying, what do I do, you know? I need to be a Christian. I can help him. What should I do? And so it goes back to letting the Lord vote. And I just said, look, I will give you the bank if you can buy it for $600,000. i will give you $600,000 and you mm. can buy the bank and we can work it out. And I said, but don't come back with 600001 See, it wasn't about a dollar. It was about, mm. I want to know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. Mm. I want to be available to do what I should do, but I don't know what to do in this case. But mm. I believe the Holy Spirit gave me the, the number of 600000 mm. So he comes running to my office. God voted yes. God voted yes. <laughs> so I think we want God to vote le yes in our lives. And I think the Holy Spirit helps and guide us when we let him. Uh, when we ask him, he wants to help and guide us. We all have talents, and I can accomplish a lot with my talents, but nothing like when God comes along beside us and blesses what we do. Yeah, so in that case, it's it's almost as though you're giving the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to intervene and give some direction there. I didn't know what to do, and I wanted God to vote, and I felt like 100% when he comes running in that I've done exactly what I should do. But starting, I didn't know what to do, but I yeah. just felt like, Lord, help me. What do I do here? And I think he gave me some guidance on what I should do. What would be your best advice to someone who says, David, I want to live and lead according to God's will, but I don't really know where to start? Well, hopefully they start by accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's a really good start that's because right. that's when... Uh, uh, we really are telling him that we want to be guided by him. And then in the scriptures and find out what the scriptures are. If we're being led by something other than God's word, then it's not correct. And so mm -hmm. I always question mm -hmm. when I'm hearing something, is it is it lining up with God's word? And if it doesn't, it's it, it's there's something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think getting into his word and find it, we'll find out where God wants to lead us. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, you know, you've been by any measure very successful as a businessman. And uh, Hobby Lobby has been blessed as it uh, does business nationwide. Uh, and yet you understand the dangers of wealth. And we see that in Scripture. In the case of Solomon, he was very successful and he became very wealthy. But that led to excesses that ultimately led to sin. And so it's been important to you to put the spiritual spiritual condition of your family and others above any type of, of worldly wealth. So talk to us about how important that is and how wealth can actually be a curse in some cases. Yeah, when we bring our officers in, I talk to them and, and a lot of our managers that are going to be future managers, and I talk to them about uh, the easiest thing for them to be as successful at business. For mm -hmm. most of us, that's the easiest thing. But the hardest thing is our marriage and raising our children to serve the Lord. And I encourage them to put their emphasis and their time and effort more on that. And that's why we're closed on Sunday and at 8 o'clock at night mm -hmm. is because we think that family is so important that we want to make it easier, better for them to have a family that really comes together like they should. And in fact, all of our employees that are on salary can go for an entire weekend that we pay for to a, a, a marriage seminar, as an example. At the local warehouse where we have over 6,000 people, we also every month have lessons on r raising children, uh, blended families, uh, marriage, things of this nature. Mm -hmm. So we want to come alongside our people and help them in whatever area that they need help. Mm -hmm. um, finances, we work with them on that, uh, that area. So 
it's important for us, if we care so much about our family, we should also care about the families of those that are working for us. And you very much practice what you preach. You've taken steps to uh, guard yourself against the temptations of wealth. You've taken steps to guard your children and your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, so tell us about those steps, the things that you've done to protect against that. Well, one of the major things we did is we put all of the stock into one, 100% one, of the stock is in 1%. And so we come together as a family. There's seven of us that sits on the board that governs everything that's that would come underneath that. For instance, the, the giving is mm -hmm. a committee. Uh, the family is a committee. Who gets what and how much do they get? So we've tried to put a governance together that would guide us to where that as a family, any family member can come to work for Hobby Lobby, but the committee that decides on salary, you get what you earn. Mm -hmm. No one in our family gets any money that they don't earn. So you, it seems like that's a fair good idea, but no one really gets in a Hobby Lobby, there's profit, and that is given away because we believe that if God owns it, He owns the profit. I say if someone in a family gets something they don't earn, you just about 100% is going to have problems. Mm. But being a steward versus an owner is 100 times easier in a family than mm. being an owner. That's where you can get into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm. Another way to say that, though, is that if you don't work for Hobby Lobby, you don't get a paycheck from Hobby Lobby. And that's certainly one of the things that David talks about is that you don't want to be given dividends or distributions mm -hmm. to kids or grandkids who aren't earning it inside the business. Let them earn their own way is the big idea. That's great. And, 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 and it's ultimately what's best for them and is going to benefit them and their, their spiritual condition and their relationship with the Lord. I just think it's a plus plus. I can't yeah. find any minuses in it. When I went from an owner to, to a steward and did that, all the legal things that we needed to do, I can't tell you the weight that was off of my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I really felt like I set my family up for success. And so no one gets something they don't earn because that's where, as I said, you're going to get into trouble if someone gets something they don't earn. Mm -hmm. But you talk about giving them opportunity. You want to give them opportunity. Right, right. exactly. Everybody is welcome to come on board. They're, they're welcome, but uh, it's, it's weird that I've got seven grandkids that are in some type of a ministry, and I've got three that's part of Hobby Lobby. So we feel like our kids ought to go where God leads them, and we're not trying to help mm -hmm. decide for them where God wants them. So we really are supportive of whatever God has for their lives. Mm -hmm. And Bill, you've seen this done well. You've seen it done poorly. So talk about some of the principles that you've seen that, that guide those who lead their families well as it relates to wealth. Yeah, one of the chapters in the book is about the 150-year family, and it's really the biblical idea that God intended your family to be a multi-generational influence. So just like David started talking about, if you understand that God's the owner, if you understand that your family's meant to be multi-generational, then what you do inside the family is you actually try to set up the family to succeed with the mission and the vision and the values. Money is secondary. Mm -hmm. It's way down the list of what you're trying to pass on. But the danger, the, the warning signals that we see is it's when families try to pass down stock ownership to kids who aren't in the business and then frankly make them wealthy, wealthy sometimes beyond what they're capable of. David sometimes says that that he uh, would wish Hobby Lobby had never existed if they would lose one kid. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big mindsets that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Let's not give windfalls to children through inheritance or passing down stock. Let's keep it together so that the main thing is the main thing, which is on God's word and the idea of living for eternity. Mm -hmm. And David, you really felt that burden as you thought about uh, how wealth might affect your grandkids and your great grandkids. And, and that uh, really forced you to make some of these hard decisions that, again, you know, go against conventional wisdom. That really put me in prayer because it was like, what am I going to do with this? Because I know that if you do any study on wealth, it's a curse. The Bible tells us it's a curse. And so I've got something that's just a curse. And so how do I handle that? Well, you just give it up. And, uh, and that here again was when it totally changed my life is to be a, a steward. And um, we love it. And because we get joy out of that. 
One of the things I think part of this is the fact that the Lord wants us to be content. Sometimes we're just not content, and I want to be content. Sometimes Bill asked me when in an interview, well, you could do this, you could buy this, you could, we could buy an island and all this sort of stuff. And I said, there's nothing I want. This world has nothing that I want. And right. so God wants us. I'm kind of like my mother. My mother was totally content, never wanted for anything. She had all that she wanted. She had all this world's goods that she wanted. And you just don't get joy for very long in this world's goods. So I think that's one of the things that we need to do also in business and all of us, and that is is to be thankful for what we have and be content with what God has given us. Well, David, you've got a lot to be proud of. You've got a, an incredible business, a wonderful family, but you warn against the dangers of pride. And as people look to you for how to lead effectively, you advise them that humility is a critical quality in leadership. So tell us why humility is so important. Yeah, I think it's such an important thing. I just think that probably it's the ugliest thing God sees in us if he sees that. In fact, I'm a preacher's son, and I found myself very successful in my early years. And uh, I, I, got it, I got to where I shouldn't have been in Hobby Lobby. And it was the, during the period of mid-'80s when we had a, a bust in oil that I found myself not only under my desk because the business doing well, but I knew I know God used that to tell me. I knew what the Holy Spirit was telling me. It says, well, you're so smart, you're going to have it by yourself. I had it by myself, and so I don't want that again. Mm. I don't think we solve our pride problem in one six months period of time, but I like to reflect back on it to know that without God, I can do nothing. Mm -hmm. And I want to give him the honor for everything he does. And all the people that come alongside us, we have great, great people that he's given us. And that's part of what our success is what he's done in terms of the personnel that we have. So I just, I never want to get there again. The mm -hmm. Bible tells you, you get on that ladder, you're going to fall. That's and right. I just don't want to get on that pedestal, so, yeah. so to speak. What are some things you do now to guard against pride and make sure that you're practicing humility? You know, one of the things I do is just common sense. And that, that is, if I have a gift, where did I get it? What is it that we have that we that we can give ourselves credit for? So I try to tell myself that, yeah, I'm a pretty good merchant and I have that gift, but where did I get it? You know, so I got it from him. So I just try to remember from whence anything comes. It comes from God. God tells us also he's the one that gives us to make us prosper and mm -hmm. to give us. So I try to go back to the word and just try to say, this comes from him. There's nothing that I can take. If I, if I believe God's word at all, I can't take anything from myself. Mm -hmm. Only thing good comes from God. So uh, I, I want to remember that. Yeah, that's so right. So many think, well, I'm the one working, right. so I did earn this money, but Scripture's very clear. It's God who even gives you the ability to work and earn that wealth. And it's the Scriptures that helps us, I think, come back to, to reality. Right. You know, Bill, you mentioned the 150-year-old uh, family, thinking about uh, not just the next generation, but even beyond that, the multi-generational family. And Pathway to Victory is the broadcast ministry of the First Baptist Church in Dallas. We recently celebrated our 150-year anniversary, and there are multi-generational families here. This is a multi-generational church. Uh, but tell us, how did you reach that mindset where you started thinking uh, about future generations and how your actions today would really influence their lives. Well, I had the opportunity to be able to come in and work with the Green family, and one of the things that we did with them is to help them develop a generational vision, a vision for the next 150 years, a vision, mission, value statement. Now that the family is using, they sell, they have an annual family celebration. But as I did that work, it also caused me to go deeper back into the scriptures. And if you go back into the scriptures, you see the picture, what did God do? He chose one family, one family, and saw Abraham from Genesis to Revelation. And the idea that through one family, if I put them in the center of the world and say, you guys are gonna live a little bit differently, I'm gonna give you a code of conduct, a way to live out your faith, so that the rest of the world would look in and say, man, these people are different. 
I wonder mm -hmm. what is different about them. And then they might look up and say, they serve a different God. And that's the idea that I think mm -hmm. the scriptures teach. Psalm 78 uh, is one of those passages in scripture where it talks about five generations, that one generation should rise up and tell the next and the next, and even the children yet to be born. And so that's the big idea. And so when we look at families like the Hobby Lobby family, the Green family, that we would say, man, what a difference it would make is if we would think generationally. One of the things that Dave and I talk about, you know, in the, in the United States, we tend not to appreciate these long lasting family businesses. Mm -hmm. But if you go over to Europe, you'll see families that you don't get into certain societies unless your family business has been around for 200 years. So that's a big idea. If mm -hmm. we just come back to really what the biblical purpose of family is, changes everything. Mm -hmm. Bill was instrumental in our company, uh, in our family coming together to put together something more formal. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have our mission, vision, and our um, values, but we formalized it. So we have a document that we left the house, Gen 1 and Gen 2, my wife and I and my three children and their uh, wives and husband. And so we came together and weekend after weekend, we just drilled down and drilled down. What is our mission? What is our mission? And what is our vision? And our vision is to go on the adventure of impacting our world for Christ. And our mission is to love God intimately, live extravagant generosity. And then our values goes into God, family, and others. So we have formalized that and we have a document. Then we took it to Gen 3, our grandchildren, and we said, can you accept this? Is there any part of this you can't accept? And so together we have come up with a formalized, this is who we are, this is what we want to be. And as, he, as uh, Bill said, once a year we have this celebration, we bring in, if they become 16, we bring them in, and we uh, have a Bible that is only ours, that we have made, mm -hmm. that's, that we all share together, or we have one for everybody. So we really tried to formalize this idea of um, having a family values, mission, and visions. And so that has been a real positive in our family. And what a model for those of us who are trying to lead our families in that way and, and want to leave that type of legacy. Uh, but again, all of your advice is so practical and actionable. Um, these uh, values that you talk about, they guide the way you live your life. So how, how does it affect how you make decisions, whether it be at home or in your, your business? How do you, how do you live that out? Well, I, th I think that is so important for us to do that, you know, especially if you're parents, you know, if you're really wanting your children to serve God, you can't just kind of uh, do what you want and say one thing and do the other. So we think there's reasons that we want to do what the scriptures say to the best of our ability, not as though there's a, a perfect marriage out there, but we want to do the very best we can because we are trying to now influence our great grandkids and our life is important to do that. And so that's what we, we hope to do so that our children grow up to serve the Lord. That's great. It's very clear that you've made family a priority in your life. Uh, and yet you also have a very successful business. And there are people out there uh, that think that it has to be one or the other. Uh, maybe they're starting a career. Maybe they're starting a business. And oftentimes they end up sacrificing their family. But that doesn't have to be the case. So how would you advise people that are saying, I want to do well. I want to be successful in my career. Uh, but my family is a priority to me. I think to first do exactly what you say and let that be the priority. And that will kind of change your mind on how you operate your business. I mean, once they're their priority, then everything else becomes second. And for instance, maybe you become better delegator, maybe. Mm -hmm. So when I left the company that I was working 60 hours a week and came to my own company, I never worked past about five o'clock and everybody said, well, you start your own business, you just gotta be 24 seven. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it's not worth it. So as best we can, as we hire people, that will come alongside us and help us to do what we have to do. Sometimes we think we're the only one that can do it and we can do it best. But a lot of times the person you, you came along and you walked besides, showed them how to do it and integrity, common sense, hard work. If you have those, a lot of times you're going to do fine. And so that's what we're looking for. And God has sent us those people. And mm -hmm. by the way, he didn't send those people to us first in every one of those. Sometimes it, it took the right person and we didn't get there overnight. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you've talked some today about decisions that you've made in the past that you realize that wasn't the best decision. So I'm going to make a course correction here. You've gained a lot of wisdom over the years through your experience. Uh, what piece of advice would you give those today who are, whether they're starting a business or starting a family, uh, but they're wondering, how do I, how do I follow uh, in his footsteps? Yeah, I think first we don't know what those footsteps are if we're not into the Word. We need to know. And of course, for me, I was so advantaged because everybody didn't come up the way I did and listen to uh, going to Sunday school all my life and knowing exactly what the Scriptures say. Not everybody has that. So I think you don't know what to do if you just haven't read the manual. Mm -hmm. Christ created, God created us, and, and He left us a manual. Mm -hmm. And uh, that manual is, is what's going to make it work. And if we're not following that manual, we're headed for a disaster. And so that's, that would be uh, what I would think would be important. It's what does God, God has something to say about a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. One of the things that David says in the book, last chapter of the book, is whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's scripture. But whether you're starting a family, you're starting a business, brand new job, whatever it is, do it with all your might. David so, says it really well. Uh, I've sometimes heard it say that God may want you to be a king, but maybe you need to be a shepherd boy first. Mm -hmm. You don't get to be the king unless you've been a great shepherd boy. And we know David was a great shepherd boy. And that's if, what is it you say about the hamburger flippers? How do you say that? Well, what I say is if you're flipping hamburgers, you better be the very, very best because that's biblical. It's biblical to do yeah. the very best you can. Probably most of us, and when we're starting out young, it's not going to end up where we're going to be. Yeah. The Bible says whatever. So whatever means a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so whatever it is, give it your best. And I think in that is when God is the one, man doesn't promote you. God is the one that will promote you from that. And you'll find what God wants you in your life, but you need to follow the scripture that says, mm -hmm. do the very best. Uh, that's that's right. what God expects of us. And that's in your family too. Mm -hmm. Do your whatever inside of your family. Do your best. Work hard at it. Work to be a great father. Work to be a great mother. All those kind of things. Do your whatever inside the family as mm -hmm. well. You know, scripture and talking about David, the shepherd boy, says, man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And it's the one who has that heart for the Lord that God can use and prosper and used to do great things. Yeah. I mean, when you go back into the scriptures, this is a fun one. Uh, where, do we, where do we find David when the scriptures, he's out taking care of the sheep. But then when we go look at Saul, his fellow king that he's going to succeed, where do we find Saul? He's looking for donkeys that he lost. Mm -hmm. So there's this great comparison of who's faithful, who's doing their whatever. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, there are many who are watching or listening today that will think that David Green is an incredible leader. Uh, but I'm never going to have 900 stores and I'm never going to have 50,000 employees. I'm sure this has a lot to say about great leadership. But this isn't just for the... CEO of a Fortune 500 company or another large organization. This is for each one of us. I know that's that's your heart. So how will this book help uh, the average Joe who's listening to us today? I guess it's just to get your priorities right. Know what is uh, temporal and what's eternal. And think about the eternal. Eternal is your children serving the Lord and, and making heaven. You want them to be there with you. So think about, we need to all think about those things. Sometimes I say there's only two things that's eternal, and that's God's Word and man's soul. So I really like to commit myself to things that's eternal. And if you do that, that's part of bringing your family up also that you want to see to make heaven as well. So um, do the very best you can and find out what God says about your life. He says so much. He didn't leave, leave us without a, an mm -hmm. instruction book. And I think it will help us to step, if we really have the love for God's Word that we should have. That's a great word. Well, for those of you listening and watching us today, I want to urge you to pick up your copy of Leadership Not by the Book by David Green and Bill High. Uh, now, guys, where is the best way for them to get this Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you can get it and find it. So hopefully it uh, will help someone. The main reason I bought this is the suffering I went in to know what to do with what God had given me and how that I knew I could really mess up. 
Well, we're grateful for the opportunity to learn from you. And I want to thank you for joining us on this special edition of Pathway to Victory. And now a closing word from our pastor and Bible teacher, Dr. Robert Jeffress. Let me add my profound thanks to David Green, along with his co-author, Bill High, for visiting us today. Remember, their book is titled Leadership Not by the Book. Together, they offer a wealth of wisdom on godly leadership. Whether you're pioneering a big business or simply raising your family, every one of us is a leader to somebody. In whatever role you're assigned, you have the best partner in the world, God himself. Your steps, your choices, your disciplines will impact generations to come. So thanks for joining us today. My hope and prayer is that something you learned today will inspire you to defy conventional ways of the world and follow God. God is on your team, and He wants to use you to make an eternal impact for Him.